Good night, everyone. And tonight's story is called The Putching Maker, and it's by Michael McLaverty. When he taught me some years ago, he was an old man near his retirement. And when he would pass through the streets of the little town on his way from school, you would hear the woman talking about him as they stood at their doors, knitting or nursing their babies. Poor man, he's done, killing himself, digging his own grave. With my bag of books under my arm, I could hear them. But I could never understand why they said he was digging his own grave. And when I would ask my mother, she would scold me. Take your dinner, like a good boy, and don't be listening to the hard backbiters of this town. Your father has always a good word for Master Craig, so that should be enough for you. But why do they say he's killing himself? Why do who say? Didn't I tell you to take your dinner and not be repeating what the idle gossips of the town are saying? Listen to me, son. Master Craig is a decent, good-living man. A kindly man that would go out of his way to do you a good turn. If Master Craig was in any other town, he'd have got a place in the new school at the square, instead of being stuck forever in that wee pokey bit of a school at the edge of the town. It was true that the school was small, a two-roomed ramshackle of a place that lay at the edge of the town beyond the last street lamp. We all loved it. Around it grew a few trees, their trunks hacked with boys' names and pierced with nibs and rusty drawing pins. In summer, when the windows were open, we could hear the leaves rubbing together and in winter see the raindrops hanging on the bare trees. It was a drafty place and the master was always complaining of the cold. And even in the early autumn, he would wear his overcoat in the classroom and rub his hands together. Boys, it's very cold today. Do you feel it? Cold? And to please him, we would answer, Yes, sir, it is very cold. He would continue to rub his hands and he would look out at the old trees casting their leaves or at the broken spout that flung its tail of rain against the window. He always kept his hands clean and three times a day he would wash them in a basin and wipe them on a roller towel affixed to the inside of his press. He had a hanger for his coat and a brush to brush away the chalk that accumulated on the collar in the course of the day. In the wet, windy month of November, three buckets were placed on the top of the desks to catch the drips that plopped here and there from the ceiling. And those drops made different music according to the direction of the wind. When the buckets were filled, the master always called me to empty them and I would take them one at a time and swirl them into the drain at the street and stand for a minute gazing down at the wet roofs of the town or listen to the rain pecking at the lunch papers scattered about on the cinders. What's it like outside? he always asked when I came in with the empty buckets. Sir, it is very bad. He would write sums on the board and tell me to keep an eye on the class and out to the porch he would go and stand in grim silence watching the rain nibbling at the bubbles. Sometimes he would come in and I would see him sneak his hat from the press and disappear for five or ten minutes. We would fight then with rulers or paper darts till our noise would disturb the mistress next door and in she would come and stand with her lips compressed, her finger in her book. There was silence as she upbraided us. Mean, low, good-for-nothing corner boys. Little Master Craig comes back and I let him know the angels he has and I give him special news about you. And she sh sh shakes her book at me, an altar boy on Sunday and a corner boy for the rest of the week. We would let her barge away, the buckets pink plonking as they filled up with rain and her own class beginning to hum now that she was away from them. When Mr. Craig came back, he would look at us and ask if we disturbed Miss Laggan. Our silence or our tossed hair always gave him the answer. <coughs> he would correct the sums on the board, five the pages of the numbers with his thumb, and listen to us reading. And occasionally he would glance out of the side window at the river that flowed through the town, and above it, the bedraggled row of houses whose tumbling yard walls sheared to the water's edge. 
The loveliest county in Ireland is County Down, he used to say, with the sweep of his arm to the river and the tin pans and the chalk walls of the houses. During that December, he was ill for two weeks, and when he came back amongst us, he was greatly failed. To keep out the drafts, he nailed perforated plywood over the ventilators and stuffed blotting paper between the wide crevices at the jams of the door. There were muddy marks of a ball on one of the windows and on one pane a long crack with fangs at the end of it. So someone has drawn the river Ganges while I was away, he said, and whenever he came to the geography of India, he would refer to the Ganges Delta by pointing to the cracks on the pane. When our ration of coal for the fire was used up, he would send me into the town with a bucket, a coat over my head to keep the rain off and the money in my fist to buy a coat stone of coal. He always gave me a penny to buy sweets for myself and I can always remember that he kept his money in a waistcoat pocket. Back again I would come with the coal and he would give me disused exercise books to light the fire. Chief Stoker, he called me, and the name has stuck to me to this day. It was at this time that the first snow had fallen and someone, by using empty potato bags, had climbed over the glass-topped wall and stolen the co school coal. And for some reason, Mr. Craig did not send me with the bucket to buy more. The floor was continually wet from our boots and our breaths frosted the windows. Whenever the door opened, a cold draught would rush in and gulp down the breath-warmed air in the room. We would jig our feet and sit on our hands to warm them. Every half hour, Mr. Craig would make a stand and while he lilted O'Donnell Abu, he did a series of physical exercises which he had taught us and in the excitement and the exaltation we forgot about our sponging boots and the snow that pelted against the windows. It was then that he did his lessons on science and we were delighted to see the Bunsen burner attached to the gas bracket which hung like an inverted T from the middle of the ceiling. The snoring Bunsen seemed to heat up the room and we all gathered around it, pressing it on top of, on top of it till he scattered us back to the places with the cane. Sit down, he would shout. There's no call to stand. Everyone will be able to see. The cold spell remained, and over and over again he repeated one lesson in science, which he called evaporation and condensation. I'll show you how to purify the dirtiest of water, he had told us. Even the filthiest water from the old river could be made fit for drinking purposes. In a glass truck, he had a dark brown liquid, and when I got his back turned, I dipped my finger in it, and it tasted like treacle or burnt candy. And then I remembered about packets of brown sugar and tins of treacle I had seen in his press. He placed some of the brown liquid in a glass retort and held it aloft to the glass. In the retort, I have water which I have discoloured and made impure. In a few minutes, I'll produce from it the clearest of spring water and his weary eyes twinkled and although we could see nothing funny in that we smiled because he smiled the glass retort was set up with the flaming bunsen underneath and as the liquid was boiling the steam was trapped in a long necked flask on which i sponged cold water with our eyes we followed the bubbling mixture and the steam turning into drops and dripping rapidly into the flask. The air was filled with a biscuity smell and the only sound was the snore of the Bunsen. Outside was the cold air and the falling snow. Presently, the master turned out the gas and held up the flask containing the clear water. As pure as crystal, he said, and we watched him pour some of it into a tumbler hold it in his delicate fingers and put it to his lips. With wonder, we watched him drink it and then our eyes travelled to the dirty, cakey scum that had congealed on the glass sides of the retort. He pointed at this with his ruler. The impurities are sifted out and the purest of pure water remains. And for some reason, he gave his roguish smile. 
He sealed up the retort again with the dirty brown liquid and repeated the experiment until he had a large bottle filled with the purest of pure water. The following day it was still snowing and very cold. The master filled up the retort with the clear liquid which he had stored in the bottle. I'll boil this again to show you that there's no impurities left. So once again we watched the water bubbling, turning to steam and then to shining drops. Mr. Craig filled up his tumbler, as pure as crystal, he said. And then the door opened and in walked the inspector. He was muffled to the ears and snow covered his hat and his attaché case. We all stared at him. He was the old kind man whom we had seen before. He glanced at the bare fire grate and at the closed windows with their sashes edged with snow. The water continued to bubble in the retort, giving out its pleasant smell. The inspector shook hands with Mr. Craig and they talked and smiled together. The inspector now and again looking towards the empty grate and shaking his head. He unrolled his scarf and flicked the snow from off his shoulders and from his attaché case. He sniffed the air, rubbed his frozen hands together and took a black notebook from his case. The snow ploofed against the windows and the wind hummed under the door. Now boys, Mr Craig continued, holding up the tumbler of water from which a thread of steam wriggled in the air. He talked to us in a strange voice and told us about the experiment as if we were seeing it for the first time. Then the inspector took the warm tumbler and questioned us on her lesson. It should be perfectly pure water, he said, and he sipped at it. He tasted its flavour. He sipped at it again. He turned to Mr Craig. They whispered together, the inspector looking towards the retort which was still bubbling and sending out its twirls of steam to be condensed to water of purest crystal. He laughed loudly and we smiled when he again put the tumbler to his lips and this time drank it all. Then he asked us more questions and told us how, if we were shipwrecked, we could make pure water from the salt sea water. Mr Craig turned off the Bunsen and the inspector spoke to him. The master filled up the inspector's tumbler and poured out some for himself in a cup. Then the inspector made jokes with us, listened to us singing and told us we were the best class in Ireland. Then he gave us a few sums to do in our books. He put his hands in his pockets and jingled his money, rubbed a little peephole in the breath-covered windows and peered out at the loveliest sight in Ireland. He spoke to Mr Craig again and Mr Craig shook hands with him and they both laughed. The inspector looked at his watch. Our class was let out early and while I remained behind to tidy up the science apparatus, the master gave me an empty treacle tin to throw in the bin and told me to carry the inspector's case up to the station. I remember that day well as I walked behind them through the snow carrying the attaché case and how loudly they talked and laughed as the snow whirled cold from the river. I remember how they crouched together to light their cigarettes, how match after match was thrown on the road and how they walked off with the unlighted cigarettes still in their mouths. At the station Mr Craig took a penny from his waistcoat pocket and as he handed it to me it dropped on the snow. I lifted it and he told me I was the best boy in Ireland. When I was coming from his funeral last week, God have mercy on him, I recalled that wintry day and the feel of the cold penny and how much more I know now about Mr Craig than I did then. On my way out of the town, I don't live there now, I passed the school and saw a patch of new slates on the roof and an ugly iron barrier ne near the door to keep the home go going children from rushing headlong onto the road. I knew if I had looked at the trees, I'd have seen rusty drawing pins stuck into their rough flesh. But I passed by. I heard there was a young teacher in the school now, with an array of coloured pencils in his breast pocket. Good night everybody, and stay safe.